Hello everyone, in this video we will be implementing a project where given an image we will be expected to find similar images from the database. So as you can see in the demo right now an image is given and then you search for similar images and similar images are displayed. So basically we will start with importing the basic libraries. First we will import OS, from PIL we will import image, numpy, torch, torch.nn as nn. We will also be needing torch vision and finally we will implement torch vision transforms. So the way we approach the problem is we will be given a database with 1000 images and then we will be passing all these images to a model and then from this model we will be getting vectors and once we get these vectors we will be changing and doing some things some operations on these vectors and finally getting the similar images. So for the images as you can see over here we have a database of all the images as you can see there are almost 1000 images over here. So finally we will come back and say images equals to os.lister images so these will read all the images and then I am going to write a line that you don't have to write because I will be setting an environment variable wherever the model is for me. So we will be using a ResNet model. So this particular line you don't have to write. Now you have to start writing by saying model equal to torchvision.models.resnet18 weights equal to default. So this will basically give your weights. After that you will declare some variables as all name, all vex and after that we are going to have model.eval which is basically put the model in the evaluation mode. Finally, we will declare another variable as root and we will be initializing it as images. Then what we need to do, we need to have some transforms because the model, ResNet model is going to expect the images in a certain format. So first transform is re, uh, resize. So we will resize all the images to 256, 256. You can also do a center crop after this and then uh, I haven't done it. And then what we are going to do, we are going to have a two tensor uh, transformation and then finally we are going to normalize all the images with this mean and this standard deviation. 2 tensor is basically used to convert the image from 0 to 255 to 0 to 1. Okay, So basically it is going to shorten the range of the values. So now after having done this what we need to do is we need to have something called as hooks. Why hooks? So let me explain it through an example. So let's say this is our neural network. As you can see there are four layers over here. So obviously what happens is you are given an input and the input is processed by the neural network. Once the processing is done you get an output of these uh, six numbers. So basically there are six neurons at the end so you will be getting six numbers. The, th the fact is that you are getting all the outputs from the last hidden layer. What if you don't want the outputs from the last hidden layer? Because let's say this model that we are using, Res ResNet 18, it is trained on for doing classification. We are not doing classification. We need only the feature vector. So what you can do here is instead of taking the outputs from the last layer, what you can do is you can take the output from the second last layer. And once you take the output from the second last layer, you can use this output to make your vectors. Now how are we going to get the values from the second last layer? Well, we will have to implement something called as PyTorch hooks. Now there are two types of hooks, uh, forward hooks and backward hooks. Like the entire concept of hooks in PyTorch is a lot bigger than this but we are only implementing a very short version of it. So in order to implement hooks you are going to have a dictionary empty dictionary called as activation. In the next line you are going to define a function get activation and you are going to pass in a name. So this is a standard way of implementing hooks. Okay, I am not going to change anything over here. This is the exact standard way everybody does it this way almost. And then what you do you define a function def hook and then you pass in three parameters model input and output. And after that inside the function what you say activation of name whatever the name is given equal to output dot detach and then you what you do you you say return hook okay and in order to register the forward hook what you say you say model dot average pool so now if you see the resonant model over here just as i said that in the last layer you have fc that is a forward connection layer but in our case I don't want the last layer. I want the outputs from the second last layer. The second last layer in case of ResNet 18 is the average pool layer. So that's why we are going to use model.averagepool.registered forward hook and inside the brackets we are going to give the function get activation and in bracket we are going to give average pool. Now what we are left with is generating the feature vectors that we had seen. So I'll start by first initializing with torch.nograd which basically means that we will not be running the backward propagation and then for every image that is for file in enumerate images 
I'm going to write a try block, which means that if there is a fault, it will basically skip that particular image. So first we'll read that image by image.open, then we will transform it with the transforms that we had seen earlier, and then finally pass it to the model by increasing in the first dimension. The reason of increasing in the first dimension is because we need a batch size. When you pass one image, batch is not given, but when you pass more than one images, obviously there is the first dimension is generally taken as the batch image. Okay. Now what I need to do is I need to have the last second last layer output. So the way I say uh, the way I say it is vec equal to activation of average pool. Then we convert into numpy because initially this was in torch and then a uh, PyTorch tensor and then it will be squeezed. So we will be removing all the unnecessary dimensions and then increase the first dimension in the start. Okay. So this is the way you get it. Okay. This is how we are going to get the second last layer output. Now I need to have a way to store this. So I'm going to say if all vex is none, which basically means that this is the first iteration of the loop, then all vec is equals to vec. So our variable vec will be stored in a uh, new variable all vex that was that we have seen sometime back. And then what we are going to so what we are going to do, we are going to say else that if this is not the first iteration and some iterations have gone, then what we will do, we will basically stack it in vertically in vertical order. We will stack the we will stack every vector in the particular file. So in the particular variable. So I'm going to say all vex is equals to numpy dot v stack all vex comma vec. And then finally, whatever the name of the file is, we will we will append it to the all names dot append. So we'll all names will be our variable, our list, and we will be appending the file name. And then we will write the accept condition and then click con or and then write continue. Basically, if there is a fault, then this will uh, not break the program and the loop will continue running. Finally, we will want to have a print. So we are going to say if I modulus 100 equal to zero and I not equal to zero. So basically after every images that have been that have been processed, I want an output so that we can see that yes, some progress have been happening. So if you save this and run, basically you are going to see all the outputs. So now what happens is if you can go over to the slides and see. So if you come here in the all vex section, you can see that there are certain values so obviously in the first uh, in the columns you're going to see feature one feature two feature three feature four feature five up to feature 512 so basically in the average pool you have 512 features and then there are vectors one vector is for every image so there are 1000 images and hence there are 1000 vectors and every vector has 512 features so as you can see it becomes a matrix of size 1000 cross 512 so this is our vector matrix now if you go to the second uh, variable all names you are basically going to see all the names of every file that has been processed one by one okay so this is the way you get it finally what you want to do you want to save these particular variables so you can write over here np.save all vex dot npy comma all vex so basically we are saving the all vex variable into a an uh, npy file and then secondly you can also save all names dot npy and then you can pass all names so we'll start with the front end of the program. We will be importing the basic libraries as streamlet as st numpy. Then we will be importing image. We'll also need time. And then finally, we need a scipy function cdist. Okay. So first thing that we do is we will see. Okay. First, first of all, you can see the two files that have been already been saved from the last file. And now what we're going to do, we are going to read those two files. So I'm going to read it in such a way that every time streamlet function is run or streamlet program is rerun, uh, reading of the data does not take place until there is a change. So basically what happens is you say st dot cache data and then you give uh, def dot read data. So st dot cache data is going to basically ensure that every time the program is run, this particular code function is not run until unless there is a change in the parameters or there is a change in the code. So inside we will say all vex equal to np dot load all vex dot npy because this was the vector variable and then all names equal to np dot load all names dot npy and finally we will return all vex and all names and then we will read the func read the data by pass uh, by uh, creating a function uh, instantiate this function so we will say vex comma name equal to read data open close bracket then we will need three columns we will say f call uh, rather we are going to say underscore comma f call to comma underscore and then st dot columns of three so we are going to have three columns but we will be only using the middle column now after that we also need two columns just be, uh, just below that for two buttons so i'm going to say s call one comma s call two is equals to st dot columns two 
now the first column in this case will be used for start or change so basically if you want to start the program or you want to change the image so i'm going to say ch is equals to s call dot button start comma change is going to be the label inside and the second button is going to find the similar images once the user is done with finding one image so i'm going to say fs is equals to s call dot button s call two dot button and then finally say find uh, find similar okay Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the next line and let's say if the first button is print, uh, clicked. So let's say CH has been clicked. So I'm going to write if CH and then we are going to take a random image from all the images. So I'm going to say random name equal to images and then find one random integer from 0 to 999 or 1 to, 1 to 1000. Okay, any random integer. And then I'm going to in the next line, I'm going to show the image and then I'm going to have a session state. If you do, if you are not comfortable with the concept of session state, I have already uh, uploaded a series on Streamlit. Basically there I have explained what these session states and all the other things in Streamlit are. Then I'm going to obviously have a session state and I'm going to use a variable disk image and then I'm going to save the random image, whatever is there. And then finally, I'm going to write that random image on the screen. Now let's say if find similar uh, program uh, button has been clicked. So basically what happens is if that is clicked, if FS, then I'm going to instantiate or rather get five columns. Okay. So I'm going to have C1, C2, C3, C4 and C5. And then I'm going to find the index of the selected image. So whatever the image has been finally selected, that is going to there for which the user wants similar images. That image, what is the index of that particular image in our database and with respect to that i'll be getting the target vector as target vec equal to vex of idx then i'll be printing that particular uh, uh, image and then what i need is i need to find the top five closest vectors so for that i'm going to use the cdist function i'm going to pass in the target vector whatever was the particular images vector that we had found and then we are going to pass all the vectors as vex and then whatever i'll be getting i'll be squeezing that now what is the cdist function so this function basically again you saw the vectors it takes some certain vectors and finds the euclidean distance for them and what after that what we are going to do we are going to do arc sort so if you are familiar with normal sort you basically have a list and a normal sort will give you the sorted list but in arc sort what happens is again you are given an unsorted list but you also take in the index and once you sort the list you also sort the index indexes. So as you can see on the screen right now. So arc sort is going to basically give you the list of sorted indexes. Okay. And you are going to take only one to sixth. Why not zero? Because this all vec this vectors are also going to include the vector of the target image and a vector's distance with itself is going to be zero, which means in every case, the first one is going to be zero. So we don't need that. So with the similar images is from the first index to the sixth index. And that's why we are going to have one to six. Lastly, what we are going to do, we are going to display all the five images that we have got. So I'm going to say C1 dot image. So basically for the first image, I'm going to open the particular image and I'm going to write names of top five of zero. So this is going to be our first or the most similar image. I'm going to copy this and paste four more times and I'm going to change C1 to C2, C3, C4 and C5 and top five also has to change from uh, index of zero to one, two, three and four. Now, if you run this particular program, you are going to see the output as on the screen right now. So obviously you have to go to the particular folder with command prompt and then write over there streamlit space run and whatever is the name of the particular file. So you do that. And once the streamlit function has run and you get the output on the browser, what you do is finally find out the uh, images. So obviously you click over here, you click on start, you get an image. Let's say you're not satisfied. You again, keep on clicking on the start comma uh, slots, start slash change. And then the images are changing. Now let's say you are, you want this image. And then what you do is click on find similar. So once you do find similar, you are getting all these find five images. Basically what will happen is first it will be running and then you'll be getting the five images. So as you can see, these are the five images that are most similar. Now again, you can go and click on uh, change. So you can click a couple of times and this the image, image will be continuously changing. And again, go on and click on find similar. And basically again, you can see these five images are very close to the image that we see on the screen right now. So I hope you understood the video and bye.